Welcome to um, everyone who's just come in from the waiting room. If you'd like to turn um, your cameras on, please feel free to do so. It's always lovely. It's easier in a Zoom meeting to actually see people's faces than to be talking to, to black boxes. Um, so please feel free to do that. We are recording the session tonight. So obviously, if you'd rather not, um, that's hi, Kerry. <laughs> if you'd rather not, you please feel free also to leave your, your cameras off. Completely your choice. Um, we do have a start time tonight of seven. So we'll just, you know, we will wait till that time clicks over. Because I know if people are like me, you usually come skidding in at the last minute. Hi, Barry. How are you? Good to see you. Donna, hi. Cynthia, hi, Lee. It's been such a crazy day here in Sydney today, hasn't it? It was so hot in the middle of the day and then the heavens just opened and it poured. Adjusting the light. I don't think we've ever been this on time. I have to, a special shout out to Jess, who's joined our team here at Team Tink in the last week. And I think she's done an exceptional job of getting us all ready and organised on time. So, um, thank you. And Mandy as well is helping me a lot, my <laughs> assistant. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. You guys have got your eyes on the waiting room, don't you, Jess? You're all over it. Yeah, we do. Fantastic. Okay, well, we've gone seven o'clock, so I'm sure on a Thursday evening, people have a lot of things to do. So we will kick off on time. As I said, um, if you're just joining us, please know that we are actually recording this meeting. So if you want to um, leave your cameras off, please feel free to do so. Um, if not, it would be lovely to see your faces. So please feel free to turn those um, cameras on. I think, you know, it's really important when we're having conversations like this and having them via the technology that we're using that we still feel like we have that opportunity to truly connect. Um, my name is Kylie Tink and I am running as an independent candidate in the next federal election and it's my very great privilege to host this meeting tonight and I want to thank everybody for coming along. This is a really, I think this is a very important conversation for our community to have and it really is focused on what role can we as a community play in North Sydney um, to act as spokespeople and speak up for Australians asylum seekers. Uh, before we actually kick off tonight, I want to acknowledge um, the First Nations people from the lands on which the North Sydney seat spreads. So that's the Camaragal and the Wollamundagal. Um, I want to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And I want to thank them for the legacy um, that they created in this amazing land. Um, I'm joined tonight by quite an extraordinary and humbling group of people. So I think we are very lucky to have the opportunity to listen to the people that are speaking to us tonight. I just, I want to introduce them um, just on top line for everyone at the moment. So we have um, Shakufa Tahiri. Um, so Shakufa is an extraordinary young woman. She's the Deputy Director of the National Refugee-Led Advisory and Advocacy Council. She's the Executive Director of the Academus Society, which is an organisation that looks after the education of girls, youth and children in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And she's a member of the advisory panel of, for Australia's resettlement of Afghan nationals. Um, joining Sakufa tonight, we have Abul Rizvi. Abul is an author, an independent Australian columnist, and somebody I think what well, many of us may have read along the way. He's the former Deputy Secretary of the Department of Immigration, and in 2004, he was awarded the Public Service Medal for contributions to the development of Australia's migration policy. Madeline Gleeson then also joins us this evening. Madeline is a lawyer and a senior research fellow at the Cowdor Centre of International Refugee Law. Um, she's the Director of State Responsibility and Borders, Offshore Processing, Protection of Children and Regional Corporate and Protection Projects. And then I'm delighted to also welcome in our audience tonight, 
um, a couple of very special guests. Firstly, to Dr. Karen Phelps, although I see it says Professor Karen Phelps on the screen, so I will amend what I've just said, Professor Karen Phelps. Um, Karen is a highly regarded civil rights activist. She's a medical educator, a political influencer. She doesn't settle for anything less than what she believes to be the best. She was the first woman elected as the president of the AMA, and she was the 2001 Centenary Medal for Services to Health and Medicine recipient. And I do also want to um, say, take special acknowledgement of Andrew and Renata Caldor, who are here in the audience with us tonight. Um, their efforts in this area are, I believe, well known by most of us. And um, we you know, owe you a great debt of service in terms of the conversation that you continue to help our community have. So thank you so much to the Caldors. We're actually going to start with a bit of a video tonight. So I'm going to hand back to the technical wizard, that is Jess, mm -hmm. and I will see you guys on the other side. Apologies, just a moment. When people seeking asylum arrive in Australia by boat, they are forcibly transferred to a third country to have their claims for protection processed there under a policy known as offshore processing. It is punitive by design. The purpose of offshore processing is to put pressure on asylum seekers to go back to the dangers they fled and to deter future asylum seekers from attempting the journey to Australia by boat by exposing people to cruel and intolerable conditions offshore. There are no exemptions for children or other vulnerable groups. Between 2012 and 2014, just over 4,000 people were transferred to the remote Pacific islands of Nauru and Manus Island in Papua New Guinea. At the start of 2022, about 230 of these people were still offshore, while more than 1,200 had been medically evacuated back to Australia. Almost a decade after first arriving in Australia, Still, they wait in limbo for a resolution. Offshore processing was tried and abolished in the early 2000s, then revived by Prime Minister Julia Gillard in August 2012. A later policy change by Prime Minister Kevin Rudd in July 2013 meant that refugees transferred offshore became barred from ever settling in Australia. Offshore processing and the ban on settlement in Australia continued under subsequent governments. But in late 2013, Australia began pivoting away from offshore processing in favour of a new boat turnback policy called Operation Sovereign Borders. Offshore processing was intended to stop the boats, save lives at sea, and break the so-called business model of people smugglers. In practice, it did none of these things. Instead, more asylum seekers arrived by boat in the first year of offshore processing than ever before. Smuggling continued, as did deaths at sea. In light of these policy failures, Australia stopped transferring new arrivals offshore in 2014 and instead focused on turning all asylum seekers back at sea without ever allowing them to access a fair asylum system, either in Australia or offshore. Offshore processing is profoundly destructive to the physical and mental health of people subjected to it. Babies and children have been exposed to extreme levels of violence, abuse and trauma. Children as young as five have tried to kill themselves and paediatricians say children transferred offshore are among the most traumatised they have ever seen. Women and girls have been raped and sexually assaulted, then denied appropriate medical treatment and exposed to repeated attacks when Australia refused to remove them from unsafe environments. Families have been deliberately separated as a matter of government policy, including spouses separated and children forced apart from their parents. Pregnant and nursing women have been forced into grossly inadequate conditions to prove that vulnerable cases will not be granted exemption. Men who fled persecution on the basis of sexual orientation were sent to Papua New Guinea, where consensual same-sex acts between men were criminalised. People with complex health needs and disabilities were sent to remote locations with inadequate health services. People died as a result of preventable injuries and illnesses. 
every expert UN body to review Australia's offshore processing policy since 2012 has expressed concern that they violate international law. Australia has even been referred six times to the International Criminal Court for crimes against humanity. Australia has no binding human rights legal framework and has not transposed its international obligations into domestic law. So it has been difficult to challenge the policy on human rights grounds in Australian courts. But Australia has been forced to defend a continuous series of cases challenging offshore processing on other legal grounds, leading to huge financial penalties for the government. In addition to the costs of defending and settling these legal challenges, offshore processing has cost Australia, at a conservative estimate, at least $1 billion per year. Even in financial year 2022, with only around 200 people left offshore, the policy is expected to cost more than $800 million. According to some estimates, offshore processing will now cost Australia $4.3 million per person per year. Offshore processing has been costly, difficult and damaging and did not stop asylum seekers from coming to Australia by boat. For an effective and humane asylum policy, cruelty and deterrence should give way to evidence-based solutions focused on protection, fairness and equality. Um, that video I think that we've just seen is no doubt an incredibly so uh, sombre and sobering insight into what is currently happening in our country and the way that we are treating those who are both seeking asylum and those who are actually truly refugees just looking for a, a safe place to be able to rebuild their lives. Um, recent events you know, have really highlighted particularly some of the brutal aspects that we have in our current policy. The detention of Novak Djokovic catapulted our um, practices onto the global stage. And while his circumstances were dealt with in, I think it was just a little on three weeks, it reminded us all that we literally have thousands of people still trying to live in Australia on temporary protection visas, while we have others that have either been abandoned overseas in offshore facilities or are still struggling to survive in indefinite detention here in Australia. People like Ali Mandy, who arrived in Australia by boat in July of 2013 as a 15 year old boy. He was originally detained in Nauru and then Brisbane for seven years, and he's now being held in the Park Royal Hotel, and he's been there for the last two years. Ali will turn 24 in 2022. Unlike Djokovic, he has no right of appeal to a court, but he could be released into community detention or granted a temporary protection visa or even granted permanent protection by the acts of one person and one minister. So Abul, I'd actually like to start with you this evening, if you don't mind, and ask you to um, help us understand, you know, the Djokovic case clearly rattled people's cages again and, and reminded us that we are not um, in a perfect situation here in Australia. How many people are we actually talking about that are in a similar situation to Mandy and um, how long have they been held? Right. I think, I think it's worthwhile um, distinguishing between two groups of asylum seekers. That is the people who came originally to Australia by boat. And my understanding is that there have been no new boat arrivals since 2014. Uh, no, none that the government has reported anyway. Um, prior to that, I think the total number of people uh, who had arrived by boat and are still part of the system is, is around 30,000, of whom around 18,000 are currently on either a temporary protection visa or a safe haven visa. The, the, the video showed those that are still in detention, either offshore or within Australia. So that's one group. A second group, which most Australians would know little about and is actually unprecedented in Australian history, is a surge in asylum seekers that arrived from about 2015. They arrived on visitor visas. They were predominantly from two nations, Malaysia and China. That surge of arrivals far outstrips in terms of size 
any previous wave of asylum seekers we've ever had in Australia's history. The number at the moment who are having their, either having their asylum application processed at the primary stage is around 30,000. Another 35,000 are at the AAT and around another 30,000, so that's 95,000 altogether, are, have been refused at both the AAT and at primary stage. So that third group is in many ways the most vulnerable group because they live in the community, they're still in the community, they have no work rights, so they are very vulnerable in terms of how they might be treated by an employer. An employer essentially could treat them in an appalling way and they will have no way or they, they, they certainly imagine that they would have no way of responding. Those people are in a very vulnerable situation. The reason I raise that group, and it's not to say play, you know, one is more worthy of our attention than another. They're, they're all worthy of our attention. They're all human beings. Um, but it is the group of 95,000 that the government keeps sweeping under the carpet. And I think the fact that these people are not in detention doesn't mean that they are not vulnerable and that they are not being abused. I think Australia needs to think about both groups and develop policy solutions for both groups. Um, Bull, is it not the case, like just hearing you speak then, what strikes me is that, um, you know, that the discussion and debate as it's been driven at the federal government level in the last little while is one that serves, it serves them to tell just one story and focuses, focus us in on one particular part. And, you know, I guess my question to you is what do, what prospects do these people realistically have of actually ever being released if they're still being detained or, or for those that are living here with this kind of non-citizen status, what does the future look like for them? Well, let me start with the first group, and which is the people who came by boat. Mm. And the point, and I'm, I'm surprised this point hasn't been made more strongly by the advocates. The point I would make in respect of that group is that when the initial boat arrivals came prior to and immediately, and for a short period immediately after Tampa, um, the government, and I was in the Department of Immigration at the time, gradually brought all of those people either to Australia, the bulk to Australia, or they were resettled, some in New Zealand and a few in, in, in a few other countries. But almost all of them had been brought to Australia within two years after Tampa, and it did not restart the boats. Mm. So the question that has never been satisfactorily answered, including by Mr Dutton and Mr Morrison, which has been put to them, why were Howard and Ruddock able to resettle these people in Australia within two years and you cannot? Mm. Does it go to issues of competency or does it go to issues of politics? Mm. And should I ask you what your personal opinion is on that? Is it competency or politics? Oh, probably a bit of both, I suspect. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, look, I've actually lost count of the number of different visas that I've I've heard people talk about and the categories of asylum seekers that you've just touched on. Um, but if you, for someone like me who's lived here all my life and is comes from a very privileged background, how difficult is this system then for people to even begin to navigate? Um, you're talking about an asylum seeker, or are yeah. you talking? Uh, for an asylum seeker, uh, undoubtedly, the, the process is complex. And Madeline could, I'm, I'm sure, speak at length that about uh, the application form is, is complex. There is no way anyone without legal training could really fill out such an application form. And there is no way you could work your way through the system without uh, help of someone who is legally trained. Mm. Which is quite extraordinary. Um, Shakufa, I'd like to come to you now, please, because I'd actually like to talk about something that we're we're facing immediately as a country. And I'd like to get your insight into how you think Australia's responded to the Taliban takeover with respect to accepting people fleeing safe, you know, for safety from Afghanistan. Um, hi everybody. Hi Kayla. Thanks for having me. I think um it's such an important discussion at a very um important time. 
Um, well, in, in terms of um, the response to Afghanistan crisis or, you know, um, uh, the fall of Afghanistan, um, I think it has been one of the most underwhelming response in response to the most tragic um, uh, sort of humanitarian crisis we've had in the history. And I think uh, one of the longest engagement Australia has ever had um, in its history. Um, so uh, in, in saying that, I think there are, you know, fair comparisons to, to be made um, about, you know, other responses we've had not so far um, in our history, uh, for instance, um, I mean, it's it's you know, with all uh, good intentions, it's 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 really it's not great to come com compare conflicts and tragedies, but unfortunately, that's that, that's the case with the world. There are conflicts, but in in terms of just how far fetched. Um, you know, certain um, conflicts are in terms of Afghanistan, it was a voluntary engagement and uh, one where we engaged uh, directly and for, for 20 years. And so the response that came um, uh, from Australian government obviously came in stages. And I think um, at the very primary level, um, the evacuation was an immediate response and one where we had to act immediately. There wasn't um, sort of any proactive plan. Um, and a lot of people were actually saved. And um, I, you know, um, the communities actually sort of admire the government response in terms of saving above 4,000 people. A lot of those people, obviously, um, that, that whole evacuation uh, cohort um, had different compositions. So you had people who already had a, a sort of a pending visa application to Australia, but you also had um, others who were more desperate, um, you know, uh, 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 particularly women and children. But I, I think it was, it was, it was so, um, it was so, uh, sort of sadden uh, that uh, I, I'm not sure how um, Australia was able to sort of, you know, filter through who who is the who was the most vulnerable and who was not. And so, um, uh, I, I mean, you can't really have a clear picture of who uh, whether there was a, that was a response that we need to sort of admire the government. It was an immediate response, but in terms of, you know, a more solid response, a national response. We we have we've had a very disappointing response, I must say, and um, and uh, I think communities were pretty dismayed. Um, actually, a few weeks ago, when the government um, you know came out and said that uh, we will accept uh, fifteen thousand um, Afghans uh, through our humanitarian channel for the next four years. Um, you compare that with the Syrian response, um, and we've actually accepted over 40,000 um, Syrian refugees, Syrian Iraq refugees, um, as a result of um, a sort of the announcement that Tony Abbott made under this government um, in, in 2014. Um, and uh, with Afghanistan's response, uh, we, uh, you know, sort of by, by virtue of engaging um, in Afghanistan's conflict, but also in sort of nation building, there is um, by default a direct obligation that flew from that, and uh, we haven't responded accordingly. Um, it's not a reasonable, reasonable response, it's not a sensible response, and um, Australian government has the absolute capacity to take more refugees and actually um, uh, sort of announce um, um, uh, a program that's that's more attuned um, uh, to uh, sort of the obligation we have in, in response to Afghanistan. So um, the communities have been left very dismayed, and I don't think that, you know, um, if uh, 4,000, uh, over 4,000 um, sort of places has already been taken by the evacuees, um, there's only... Um, it leaves only a thousand or a few hundreds um, actually uh, to be taken for this financial year um, and spread that through you know the next years and that is by the way within the existing humanitarian uh, program which is already a reduced program they actually cut down the program from 18,000 um, uh, uh, 745 to uh, you know 13,745 so it was already a reduced program and, and it just imagine sort of the I, I, I understand that there's a lot of need for resettlement and I don't don't think settlement is a, a durable solution, but um, in, when, it, when it comes to Afghanistan, the sort of the precariousness and uh, uh, and, and our engagement, it obviously calls for um, a, a more um, you know solid response. Um, and I think you know Afghanistan is just. Um, you know, extraordinary that everything happened within the space of weeks. Um, you know, I was born in Afghanistan. I was actually left very, very shaken and shocked, actually um, spent months trying to recover from the trauma. And I'm actually going through uh, all of those uh, because uh, I think that uh, we didn't really expect um, the world to react the way they did. 
we didn't expect um, sort of the Taliban to just take over and um, sort of the coalition forces uh, or the coalition uh, governments that were involved actually um, responding the way that they did. Um, the peace process that was, um, I think uh, now that we reflect on uh, was a facade. And I mean, uh, there are a lot of a lot of things to be disappointed about how it was all handled leading up to sort of the fall of Kabul. Um, but right now, um, the country is actually an epicenter of a disaster. Disasters. On the one hand, you have economic crisis, economic fall down of the whole country, of the economic institutions, of all government institutions, really, um, including health, um, uh, health institutions. Uh, but you also have um, sort of a, a population uh, that is that are on the verge of starvation. So you have actually um, millions of people who won't have a loaf of bread to survive. Um, and then you have sort of the you know um, the crisis of uh, people being in direct danger of the Taliban because they are at the end of the day a terrorist group with draconian rules um, and uh, with minority groups of women, children, um, you know, um, uh, sort of uh, minority religious and cultural groups uh, in direct threat uh, from the Taliban. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, with, with all of that in mind, I think um, Australia's response could have been so much better. We had the absolute well, and actually, it's interesting, Shakuf, I was talking to somebody earlier this morning who um, wanted to, and, and back to your point, you know, you don't ever call out one conflict as being worse than another. None, none of them, you know, are where we want to be as citizens of this world. But they pointed to the difference of when Vietnam fall and the, and the fall of Saigon and Australia's approach during that period, I mean, my understanding is there were significantly more people were immediately evacuated from Vietnam in that circumstance. Is that right? Um, absolutely. I mean, I can't speak to the details because I have to go and flip um, some history chapters and go back to my year 11 history <laughs> subject. More an history subject, um, uh, but um, all in all, um, the response to Vietnam, um, uh, sort of uh, the fall of uh, Saigon, was actually uh, I'm talking uh, talking more about the long term response than uh, sort of the national response, where we have actually time to think and we think of solutions, we think of alternatives, we think of a number that um, you know Australia has the capacity to welcome, um, but also like the tone of the welcome back then was very different. It was a welcome, a genuine, sincere, uh, nationwide welcome. Uh, in the case of Afghanistan, I think that um, uh, because there was that relationship uh, that was built between Australia and Australian public and their psych for 20 years, um, there was a huge public support, you know, from, you know, um, sort of Catholic institutions to schools to the wider public. Um, uh, but uh, I, I'm still confused as to why the government didn't actually take all of that public support into consideration. Um, and um, we have a very inbuilt settlement um, sort of infrastructure. Um, uh, we have the capacity to do it before. Uh, do it um, in you know in the next few years. Um, but with with uh, Vietnam response, um, in 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 a matter of a few years, they actually welcomed over seventy thousand Vietnamese through just the humanitarian channels. So we're not even talking about you know sort of immediate evacuation, which is actually an emergency measure. Um, and you don't you're not really proactive. You can't really plan. You just uh, do whatever you can um, you know as a government. But um, sort of the long term plan where you where Australia has had a good few months to think about. And, you know, as tragedy unfolds, uh, I think it's, a, you know, sort of a, a moral um, a crisis um, as well, if you think about it and the response that we got. Um, Karen, I, I hope you don't mind. I'm actually going to pull you in from the audience because, I mean, you are the one person sitting in this room tonight that I can see who has lived the experience of being in government um, as a politician and as a representative. I mean, you did extraordinary things in terms of passing the Medi Medivac Act. But while you were there in that building in Canberra, what is the tone of the conversations around our humanitarian record? Jess, can you take um, Karen off mute, please? Um, she should be able to click. Yeah, the... there you go. <laughs> uh, thanks, Kylie, and, and thanks, Shakufa and Abu, for your comments. So very insightful. Uh, the tone of the conversation depends on who's doing the talking. Uh, you get a lot of uh, uh, tough talk from coalition MPs. Uh, you get a lot of... Uh, uh, you, you get differing views from different people depending on their political perspective. Uh, people are very cautious about reform and the political consequences of reform. 
uh, unless you happen to be uh, talking to somebody in the Greens who uh, seem to have, you know, quite fixed ideas uh, about which way things need to go. Uh, what was very interesting about the whole period of time around late 2018, early 2019, leading up to the Wentworth by-election in 2018, uh, there was the activation of the, the hash, hashtag Kids Off Nauru campaign. And that was a re remarkable coalition of community representatives, uh, people of all ages, people of all political persuasions, uh, the medical profession uh, and, and, and other uh, professions coming together to support the notion of removing all of the children and their families from Nauru. And that became a really major uh, point of difference, if you like, in, and, and, a, and a major talking point in the Wentworth by-election. And then when it came to my uh, coming into parliament, I think it might have been the fastest that legislation was ever drafted <laughs> and passed in, uh, in, in people's living memories. And that was because we had uh, a, a, an activated crossbench, which uh, when Julia Banks crossed from the Liberal Party to the crossbench, we, for a brief and shining moment, had the balance of power. Uh, we had the Labor Party who were prepared to talk about uh, what were the priority issues that we could realistically get through, um, bearing in mind some of the differing perspectives that there were and also the political realities. And we had an inundation of refugee advocates <laughs> who were in the building uh, and who had wonderful legal advice and representation who were able to help us work out what was possible and then drafted into legislation that we were able to get agreement on from Labor, the Greens and the crossbench. And so we, we were able to pass the Medivac legislation. Uh, your question was about, about what's the tone of the conversation. I found in negotiating the conversation with the refugee advocates uh, the, uh, the people from Medicine Sans Frontier, the, the doctors, psychologists and social workers who'd been working on Manus Island and Nauru. Uh, we spoke to um, uh, people of faith who had been working with refugees in uh, Papua New Guinea. Uh, an extraordinary amount of negotiation uh, and discussion. And I found that what everyone of, of, of good intent was talking about was about finding a workable solution that we could get through Parliament in the time that we had. Uh, and I think we're coming up to another election now. We're coming up to an election within months. And I think it's really important to, to get the ask right and uh, to, to look at what uh, is, is, is most urgent and what is achievable in terms of of reform. Now, we, we can go into that further uh, down, down in the evening, if you like. Mm, I think we'll, we all come back to that, Karen. I, I just want to reiterate one of the key messages I heard or the key things I heard you say, though, then is that the the challenge or the opportunity that was presented to you was looked at in terms of what can we get done here? What is possible? Um, rather than you know, how do we put up a new barrier? How do we bring a barrier down? And, and that's a really strong, strong message to me that I hear from that action. Um, Madeline, I'd like to come to you now because we've heard, you know, from, from people who've, who've lived, lived and continue to live the policy space, who have seen the impact on the community. Karen, who's worked within the political environment, you are our legal brain here tonight. And I just, I'm really interested to, um, hear from you you know how is it possible that we have a, an environment here where people can be held indefinitely and does any other country have that kind of status when it comes to dealing with people who are seeking refuge thanks kylie and and thank you to everyone else who's on the call this evening it's a pleasure to be here uh, with the other panelists to talk about this important issue uh, the reason, the real reason we've got to this place in Australia legally is that unlike almost every other liberal democracy in the world, we do not have in our domestic law uh, basic protections for human rights. 
and in that sense, Australia really is quite exceptional. Now, that's not to say that every other democracy in the world magically has no human rights issues. Obviously, every country has its problems and, and grapples with these situations, not just in the immigration space, but elsewhere. Um, but at least having that framework, whether it's a, a bill or a charter of rights, uh, whether it's other national legislation that, that contains those rights and protections, uh, perhaps, you know, in Europe, they've got the regional uh, uh, human rights framework and other regions as well, that allows some sort of structure around these matters, that they must take place within a minimum uh, level of protection um, of, of rights and freedoms. So that's why we get to this place in Australia, we've got nothing in our law and, and the last 24, 48 hours we've really seen play out in, in a different context, uh, what happens in a country that is trying to sort of make this stuff up as it goes in a, in a highly politicised environment issue by issue, rather than taking a more systematic approach and saying, we've signed up to all these international conventions. Um, we actually, most Australians would say that they reflect common Australian values that, that anyone living in a liberal democracy would agree to. Uh, let's codify that. And that way, you know, you can, you can take these matters to courts, you can have them worked out in a more uh, predictable uh, and strategic, a systematic way, uh, rather than the situation that we have now. So often we hear about, you know, the godlike powers of the minister, and that certainly came out around the, the Djokovic detention issue. And, and there's a lot of focus on how much power certain ministers have or the department might have. Um, the issue is not really the level of power that they have. It's the, the lack of checks and balances on that power. It, it is not unreasonable for the, the minister and the department with that expertise to be exercising that power, but it's the fact that there is no Bill of Rights uh, that there is no uh, legislative guidance for the minister to say, you know, when making this decision, what are some of the factors that you need to consider? Um, that could be one other way of check and balance. And then there's also the fact that progressively uh, the ability of the courts, of the judiciary to oversee the way these decisions are being made has been stripped back. So the courts have been progressively excluded more and more from their traditional role of sort of oversight of how the executive does what it does. Um, so yeah, bringing the judiciary back in would be another way of doing that. So it, it, these things don't necessarily need major reform. Obviously, a Bill of Rights would be a major reform, but there are much smaller steps that could be taken just to try and start introducing a little bit more uh, predictability and oversight into the way that these powers are exercised. I'm actually, I'm fascinated and, for, you know, forgive my ignorance in this area, but what I'd like to understand, and I don't know if you can answer this question, Madeline, but how is it that we don't have a bill of rights i mean my my take of it is i mean the american the constitution was their bill of rights immediately written into the constitution i feel like i hear that all the time whenever you hear an american speak have do places like the uk and new zealand have they always had bill of rights as well or are there other countries that have been like us and they've had to kind of bring it into their culture as their cultures matured a bit of both. In every country, it will be different, you know, and there are some countries that have, you know, evolved their national law. Um, you know, the UK at the moment, after Brexit, is working out what that means, but they have their own national laws as well around human rights. So in every country, it can be done differently, and it needs to be, you know, applicable to the historical context of the country and, mm. and its political system. Um, but the content of those rights are universal. And, and they were first recognised in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, to which all states have signed up. Uh, when was so that? When was that? At the end of the Second World War. Right. So that was when the world came together and said, that was really, truly appalling and shocking. And we need to restructure the way we interact with each other as countries if we're going to avoid that type of war again. And so at that stage, we had the formation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the formation of the United Nations and all of the structures built up around that. And certainly in many ways, the UN can be subject to criticism uh, and people say it could work differently in this way or in that way, but it is important that that institution exists uh, as a place where states come together and that all of us uh, hold all other countries, including ourselves, uh, to account for the promises we've made about human rights and, and other things as well, about peace, you know, not resorting to conflict, all of these other things that, you know, we take for granted, but that is what allows the world not to send into world war again. So is it the case, so we are signatories to an international code of conduct, for want of a better word, but we have not translated 
those international obligations into our own national framework. That's exactly right. Not only did we sign up, Australia was instrumental in drafting uh, a lot of these instruments, in actually forming this code of conduct to begin with. Uh, and then in other ways, we don't need to look internationally to see what we should be doing. The, these norms are really aligned with what most Australians would say are common Australian values. You know, the, mm. the big one is the protection of children. Uh, I don't think many Australians would say, yes, it's really Australian to lock children up for decades until they become adults you know, and subject them to the worst trauma that paediatricians have ever seen, potentially irreparable damage. That's not in line with Australian values, uh, but that is where our policy has gone. Mm. Um, Abul, can I come back to you? Because I just, you know, you have had that experience of working within the system um, while it, it has been functioning. And I'm, I just would love to understand from you um, what you think it's like for people who are working in this area of our Australian government at the moment? Well, right now, working in the Department of Home Affairs would be very difficult. And uh, I know that over the last, well, probably uh, more than five or six years ago, we had a very substantial exodus of senior immigration officers from the department. Um, they were unable to um, continue working there. They went to all sorts of different departments. As a result, uh, the Department of Immigration at the moment has remarkably few senior officials who have been there any length of time. I'd been in the Department of Immigration 17 years and I was still viewed as a newcomer. Mm. It, it, so it, corporate it, history is just not yeah. there. And, and which I'm not saying being there a long time is a good thing, mm. but having a mix of people who are both new as well as having been there a long time is good. It's that mix we no longer have. And sadly, I think in terms of repairing the system, the lack of that mix is going to be an obstacle. Um, I think it, just while I've got you, Paul, one of the things I'm noticing with a lot of people that I'm talking with on various aspects as it relates to governing in this country, there seems to be a, a consistent theme coming through that we've kind of moved away from a model where we had a strong public service structure that actually was fundamentally there regardless of who was in government. There was a process and approach to how we did business in Australia and we agreed that that was worth investing in and protecting in. Mm. But that what we've seen in recent years is that actually that public service um, kind of protection has been whittled away and we're now far more reliant on external consultants. We don't have the capacity. And in fact, we sort of have a system now where the, the ministerial staff are saying, well, no, we'll call the shots versus, you know, seeking advice on, um, you know, what we should be doing. Is my observation fair in this space? Do you think it's the same sort of thing, therefore, has happened in the Department of Immigration? I can quote no better authority than um, than um, Ms Higgins from yesterday's, or I think, yes, it was yesterday. Time moves on quickly. It was yesterday. She gave she gave an answer to a question about, about ministerial staffers and the public service. And she said, and she was a ministerial staffer, remember, not a, not a public mm. servant. And she said the relationship between ministerial staffers and public servants has become akin to upstairs, downstairs. Mm which is not going to be healthy in any way, shape or fashion, is it? And I, the reality is, whether we like it or not, politicians do come and go and political parties do come and go. But for us to have, you know, some stability in our nation, surely we have to have a backbone, which is, is predictable. Um, Shakufa, I just want to come back to you. I, I, and my heart goes out to you because I get a sense that you, do you still have family in Afghanistan at the moment? Um, yeah, I think... Uh, just by virtue of, um, you know, myself actually leaving Afghanistan um, uh, from the sort of first round of um, Taliban rule, uh, we left a lot of people and that applies to thousands of uh, people from Afghanistan and Australia. So we have a very strong Afghan diaspora community in Australia. And uh, for, for me personally, of course, I have families um, and, and friends in Afghanistan, um, you know, sort of uh, trying to find a route uh, to safety is, is, is important. 
just to exit Afghanistan because uh, now the whole country has fallen to the governance and administration of Taliban. Um, and so by virtue of just, you know, being from a minority group uh, with our families and friends, both culturally and religiously, um, it just, um, I think, uh, begs uh, sort of the question of how much threat there is uh, for them, especially because uh, with the memory, the recent memory from the Taliban and how they persecuted the minorities um, hasn't really vanished yet. It's a very, um, it's in very recent history. People had a bit of, you know, uh, gap and a bit of space from um, sort of the first uh, round of uh, uh, Taliban uh, cruel ru ruling. And um, yet again, they, they fell. It just um, felt like a, a bit of a dream, um, even though it was uh, sort of in between, uh, you know, peace and war, it was still uh, some uh, a sense where sort of people uh, were able to live and, you know, um, hope for at least for a better future. But that people so you know um i think in the last few months it's just been an effort of trying to find ways uh, for for families uh, to be saved um i've had uh, sort of close family members um who've uh, you know sort of worked with the previous government um and uh, yeah i was uh, sort of repeatedly was being sent you know voice messages messages of like taliban sending direct threats to them and that would literally wake me up in the middle of the night and i would get chills out of it it was just me really <laughs> you know um i think um a sense of not even being present um here in the relative safety because the sort of uh, the lack of safety and the danger and the threat uh, is a vicarious one we um do feel it here so i think that obviously i'm not an exception in that um thousands of uh, you know people from afghanistan have their friends and i think my heart really does go out for you know uh, people on temporary protection visas who've been here for a very long time and um and don't have sort of any recourse to save their families and, and and when i talk about family they have their wife and children and loved ones stuck um you know under the taliban uh, absolutely trapped uh, uh, with um you know no ability to gain visas uh, for other countries because obviously you know, um, uh, sort of the neighboring countries have also limited um, uh, grant of visas um, to their countries, even temporary, temporarily. Um, uh, it's just, you know, a, a sort of a situation of, um, uh, you know, large prison, um, if I can actually metaphorize it that way. <laughs> um, so it, it, you can imagine that um, it's just um, a very difficult situation um, as we as we live through this, this phase of Taliban being in, in government again. Um, Karen, coming back to you, I mean, we have such a, what feels like a very layered and, and messy situation on our hands at the moment in terms of we have legacy issues that, you know, if, if we choose to face into a country, uh, into as a country, you know, we would need to address. And I, I guess for me as someone, the thing that I'm doing at the moment, what I'm so mindful of is what do we do into the future and what do we look like as a, a country going into the future? Do you have any kind of insight um, into what um, you think we need to be prioritising as a, and is she still here? Oh yes, there she is. <laughs> um, do you think we need to be prioritising as we move into this next term of government? I think we need to be asking the um, asylum seeker and refugee community what they think needs to be uh, prioritised without having those solutions imposed upon them. Mm. Uh, I, I think the greatest insights that I had were from people who were actually in the situation of being on temporary protection visas or uh, tr trying to make a life for themselves in the community that are separated from, from, from family and from, from uh, you know, from opportunity, not being able to be free to live their lives in the way that they wanted to live their lives. And so what the, uh, what the government needs to do is to solve this impasse. And there are several impasses, and it's beyond the scope of our discussion tonight to talk about each one. Uh, but I think that they, they need to be prioritised. And, and, and I think, you know, for, first and foremost, there must be um, a, a humane solution for the people who are in currently in indefinite detention. Uh, it, it is a nonsense to talk about people who have been in offshore detention being processed for almost a decade. These people were processed many years ago. And the problem was that in successive governments trying to outdo each other in cruelty, uh, what it meant was that, that, that there was no plan, there was no second stage of the plan. So it was like, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to stop the boats 
and we're going to have offshore detention and then brick wall. There was no solution after that for resettlement of the numbers of people whose lives were being, being impacted by this. You've got people who are in hotel confinement, we've got people in other places of detention, we've got people who are offshore, we've got people in the community. Uh, there has to be, I think, a comprehensive and appropriate way of making sure that every single one of these people has a solution that is appropriate to their circumstances. Mm. Now, that's not going to be a short a short term um, uh, solution, but I, I think what we need to be doing is to to do whatever we need to do, whether it's to set up a special um, committee of you know senior public servants. Uh, experts in the field, people from the, the who are advocates from the refugee community, lawyers who are experienced in this area, health professionals, and get together and, and actually set out ways of solving this problem. I mean, it reminds me of after the Medivac uh, legislation was passed, it was like, okay, we've got the legislation, but then the government refused to put into place the next step, which was how do we go about processing the medical needs of the people who need this medical care and need to be evacuated back to Australia. And so it was up to a group of volunteer medical professionals to actually set that process up and make it happen. Uh, so I think it would be important for, for the uh, whichever is the incoming government to actually formulate a sensible, workable, comprehensive solution for each individual who is stuck in this circumstance. Mm. Um, thank you, Karen. I, I think it seems, as you say it, it just seems so logical and so, you know, obvious. Um, and if this was just a business you were running and you had an issue that had been brushed to the back and you'd let kind of stay there for over a decade, you certainly, you know, the board would be jumping up and down and people would be being held to account for why it hasn't been resolved. Um, I think personally, one of the things that I look at and I reflect on is the role that fear has played in our society and whether, you know, to an extent, um, we've actually enabled ourselves to become smaller as a nation and we've used fear as the reason to do that as opposed to remaining brave and open and optimistic. And um, I think, you know, it, it, on all those circumstances, hopefully that's that's the opportunity that presents itself with you know a, a change in in government potentially um i would like to invite if anybody um on the call has a question for any one of um our incredible speakers tonight please do pop it in the chat um i'm keeping an eye to the side so i'm and i'm very happy to direct that question to um any one of the speakers i mean i guess you know and this is the we have 10 minutes left, and, and but what I would like to ask each of the people that have spoken to us tonight is that if you could change one thing in the next 24 or 48 hours, what would you prioritise changing? Um, okay, and Abul, you nodded very emphatically, so I think you have a very direct answer for me. Let's start with you. Throughout the time that I was in the Department of Immigration, we had one principle in respect of asylum seekers, which we thought was immovable, that no government would ever shift on it. And that is, if you have been found to be a refugee, you cannot be in detention. It's a fairly simple proposition, but I cannot believe that that is a proposition that, that isn't written into the way we manage um, the asylum seeker system. Mm. Okay, beautiful. I hear that. I can hear that coming back into our legislative framework moving forward. Shakufa, what would be the one thing that you would focus on changing? Um, I think uh, copy paste is not always useful, but I, I think in this case, I will just copy paste what Abu said. <laughs> it's to actually um, a sort of change, uh, you know, um, as the regulations around how, uh, you know, once you're recognized as genuine refugees under domestic laws that you should be granted permanent protection um, for TPV holders and 30,000 of them in, in our community. Today, actually, what me 
um, really deep. There was actually I was speaking with uh, with someone on uh, on Chef, which is actually a five year visa, temporary visa. He had been in that visa for ten years, um, and uh, he has three kids uh, who are stuck in a sort of um, second country of asylum in uh, Quetta, Pakistan. His a wife has a fourth grade uh, cervical cancer, and uh, he reached out to me to help him, and I didn't know what he was asking me in terms of what I could help him. But the situation seemed seemed so desperate that he felt fatigued in terms of what challenges um, he needed to resolve because uh, if one thing could be done was to actually you know enable um, a family reunion for him but with the the fact that he has a temporary visa comes you know quotes that you can't really uh, you can't reunite with your family you can't have family reunion so imagine his wife in hospital bed for months um, desperate to see her husband as, as a moral support and in, in dying, really. So um, if I could change that, uh, uh, I would uh, for thousands of people, especially uh, for, you know, um, uh, in the in the wake of Afghanistan fall, um, that you have about 5,000, um, uh, you know, uh, Afghan refugees, mostly from the minority group, Hazaras, um, that are on temporary protection visa. And um, if anything, temporary protection is an antidote to any type of protection. If protection comes, it has to be permanent, it has to be certain, it has to enable the holders of uh, uh, you know, uh, any type of protection, visa holders, um, to build a future, to build certainty, to reconnect with the community, to build their financial and economic capacity, to have a basic decent life, and that's not being given by the current um, uh, policies that we have. And I say that my uncle also actually passed away from cancer in December, and he was in as well on five year visa. So this hits really deeply for me personally. Um, he was in, in deathbed and uh, just uh, not complaining of you know the, the the pain that he had from fourth grade brain cancer, but uh, you know uh, being in absolute pain about family separation and wanting to see his wife and kids for the last time. And I felt absolutely you know, um, heartbroken that I couldn't do that for him because policy did not allow, but he uh, he was a cancer patient and he could not understand why. It just beggars belief because I, and I think, I hate to say this, but my brain also just goes to the lost potential here, like the lost productivity, the lost loyalty to our nation. The fact that, you know, these are people, and I, I really hear what you just said, Shakufa, it's in the name of the visa, this is temporary. Temporary protection visa should be exactly that until a permanent solution can be identified, is my personal opinion. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Madeline, if you had one thing that you could change. One thing. Well, given that the other two have already mentioned very important points, uh, we are overdue for offshore processing to be wound up. There are less than 1,500 people in this caseload. It, it is relatively tiny, the number of people. They arrived almost 10 years ago. Uh, there is no evidence-based reason to think that resolving those cases is going to have any broader impact on the number of people trying to reach Australia by boat or by any other means. Uh, and I say that because progressively people have been resettled to the US and elsewhere and we haven't seen any huge uptick in boats. So mm. there is no sound reason why those 1,500 people after almost a decade should not immediately have their situations resolved. And that could involve uh, taking up New Zealand on their offer to take about 150 people. Um, and for those who are in Australia, and I see there's a question in the chat about the people in the Park Hotel, uh, they should be granted protection in Australia if they have been found to be refugees, you know, presuming that there is no security risk assessment against them, which I think in most cases there isn't, anyone in detention should be released and that situation should be resolved. Because really I think it does go to competency and political will if you're going to say that after a decade for such a small number of people, almost all of whom have gone through all the processes and been found to be refugees, if we can't settle them now, then there's no clear reason why we can't settle them now that could be done this week and Karen I know you talked about consulting with you know the, the people that it affects to come to the uh, you know a suitable outcome but if you had the power the ministerial pen for 24 hours what would be the one thing that you would focus on addressing immediately mine's a big ask Kylie I, I would put together a uh, a, a group of uh, independent experts to advise the government in a uh, non-partisan way 
and 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 with 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 multi party support uh, to find uh, to to set priorities uh, for uh, what needed to be done immediately. For example, the fifteen hundred people who are in offshore uh, detention at the moment, and the release of the people who are currently. Uh, in places like the Park Hotel who have refugee status, and then to work out a, a path forward for solving all of the other problems in this shambolic situation. Um, and that's actually a nice um, kind of opportunity for me. Gwen has actually posted in our chat, um, ex telling, sharing with us a story about some experiences she's had with four men who she's supporting here in Australia and has been doing so since 2011. She's made um, presentation to our current member and she said, you know, the response she got from him was basically that he just nodded sadly. And she's very directly said to me, what would you do, Kylie? And I think, um, for me, Gwen, this is where I am excited by the opportunity to stand and advocate as an independent for my community and to be my community's voice. Because while any member of any party will need to smile and nod politely, knowing that while they can listen to you, when it comes to the point of a vote, they're going to have to vote with their party lines, the strength of an independent is that my voice will be an expression of your voice and your desire. And I mean, we, I'm sure everyone on this call knows, but this is, this is an area that I am very passionate about. You know, in 2014, I worked with a coalition of people from very broad background to try and get kids out of immigration detention centres. And um, we launched a campaign called We're Better Than This Australia and 750 children were released from detention centres. Um, to my shame, they were released on temporary protection visas. And I actually don't know what happened to those children. Those children are probably part of the 30,000, you know, that we've spoken about tonight that are still moving around. At the time, we felt that we had done good and we celebrated. I remember a very senior member of our team saying, we got the kids out of the burning house, Kylie. You know, we got them out of the burning house. But to your point, Karen, her next comment was now we need to work out what to do with them. And there was just no willingness then once they were out of that house for the system to meet us, to work out how we move it forward. Um, I think what is really clear to me is that the people of North Sydney are not happy being silent on this matter. Um, that they want to be heard in Canberra as a voice that says we can do better, we should do better, we have the capacity to do better. And I just want to touch on something that um, Karen just mentioned, and it, it, I may be being cheeky in offering this up, but somebody um, who I met the other day on one of the streets said to me, he, he very lovely guy, and he, and he said to me, oh, it's really lovely to meet you, but, you know, I, I have to stay bipartisan, you know, I can't, I can't be one party or the other. And I actually looked him in the eye and I said, you know what, then I am the perfect candidate for you because by definition, I am independent and I am not partisan. <laughs> I work to get an agenda driven um, in the best way that we can get that outcome. Um, so I think that that's what's exciting. You know, Karen showed us what was possible um, as a strong independent on the cross bench, she was able to negotiate and manoeuvre and brought about, as she said to us tonight, one of the fastest pieces of legislative reform that we've had um, in this country. And it created a really important opening in our society. Unfortunately, it wasn't then pushed out to be the wider wedge that it could have been. I think I feel optimistic that one of the things that we can do as a community to move that forward is to help get more strong independent voices on a crossbench, give the crossbench a bigger um, bat to be playing with when they go into the house and then, you know, use that independent voice to bring both of the major parties back to the table to have a conversation that we won't let settle and we don't let go silent. Um, Thank you. I am very conscious of time and it is two minutes past eight. 
I, um, I know there was a couple of questions we didn't get to, and I'm, I'm very sorry about that. They were very good questions as well. And I will take note of them because I think it would be good for us as a community to bear them in mind. Um, but I, again, um, please, can everybody um, join me in thanking our amazing speakers tonight, to Abul, to Shakufa, to Madeline, to Karen. Thank you so much. And to everybody that's shown up here tonight to um, make your voice heard around that um, around this issue and to let me know that you do care and this is an issue that you would like to see your local member um, address, I want to thank you too. Um, it's very much at the moment one day at a time as it comes to this campaign and as I said to some Authorised by Kylie Tink, North Sydney, New South Wales.